you know, the same kind of AI that you use with Open, uh, open AI or ChatGPT and the Google AI or Gemini is being able to go in there and have an iterative conversation yep. through natural language. That's going to enable non-technical people to ask business exactly. questions and get real answers that they can understand and then iterate on. Yeah. I do think we've got a bit of a challenge uh, on, uh, I think it's gonna be a, a art almost like prompt engineering, huh? where do mm -hmm. you start? And uh, do we get the right answer to uh, the question we're asking? And obviously AI sometimes can just go in the other direction. I've did some, uh, some of the tryout over the weekend myself as well. Uh, it's interesting to see, but I mean, we're gonna get there because this gets smarter and smarter. So I think this whole co-pilot, the, the conversation, conversational part is going somewhere. It's also fair to say, I think at this moment we're in, uh, not even in prototype, but in proto-hype uh, situation. So everybody, uh, it's a second buzzword. Well, we've seen some buzzwords in our industry, uh, blockchain, zero trust. I mean, uh, I had some zero trust coffee today. I mean, the <laughs> <laughs> hundred percent extra AI. Uh, yeah, extra, uh, exactly. But but I think AI is a different uh, dimension to it because it's going to change fundamentally how we uh, how we work with our systems, and I think that's uh, that's a great uh, addition. This is identity at the center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad. You sound a little gravelly there for a second. I know. I'm not sounding very gravelly. What's going on? <laughs> I don't know, man. You're in Vegas. so It's very dry here in Vegas, but I'm having a fantastic time. This is a very international conference, you know. I mean, we have folks a lot from South America, Canada, Europe. Um, just thinking of Espen Bago, mm -hmm. who's here. He's one of our friends, friend of the show, and... You know, a long time friend, just mostly just from interacting. He's just such a, a great person. Our guest today, uh, Danny, is coming from one of my favorite countries in the world, the Netherlands, which I always call just Holland. Just a fantastic place. And, you know, it's one, I, I think it's one of the underrated aspects of this conference. So I've never been, but yes, it is a worldwide attendance. So you have already alluded to it. We got Danny DeVries, who's the VP of Identity and Access Management at Talos. Welcome, Danny. Thank you, guys. Great to be here. Well, thanks for taking the time. Definitely want to give a shout out to RSM for helping us get here, and then also Cyber Risk Alliance for giving this lovely recording space that you're seeing on probably YouTube. Uh, but let's get into it, Danny. How did you get into identity? Is it something that you chose, or did it choose you? Well, actually, it's a good question. I think it's a bit of both, to be true, uh, truthful here. Uh, I also realized this morning that it's my 25th year more or less in identity and access management, although in the early part of this, we would not be calling it like that. So um, uh, did it choose me or did, it, uh, did I choose it? I mean, let me take you a bit on my journey. Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm a business guy, yeah? so uh, you may uh, ask me some very technical questions and it will be slightly more difficult for me to answer. But when I started actually uh, my first company, uh, we focused on a thing called enterprise portals. And Almost immediately, we ended up with a problem because I liked this idea of personalization. I liked us to actually bring things to customers in the way they like it to be. And we found out that identity information was not stored in one place, but in multiple places. So before we actually really could embark on a personalization journey in a portal, you know, we had to sort something around identity and access management. I mean, we called it by then user management. And I heard my techie guy say, we need a meta directory to aggregate all this kind of stuff. In the end, my interest yeah, uh, it was delivering an enterprise portal. So, I mean, I obviously uh, ran into IAM because of doing this. Uh, so did it choose me? Did I choose it? Uh, I think a bit of both in this, in this case. Um, I've uh, been in this space uh, ever since that moment. Uh, we, roll, uh, we ran more and more into the IAM space. Uh, user management, focus on B2E, enterprise portals, early days. Uh, I was running a company called Everett, which was uh, in the zeros, the largest European boutique SI in IAM. So we worked with a lot of the, uh, the incumbent players at that moment in time, Novell, Oracle, Sun Microsystems. Uh, later on, uh, we saw some others as well coming up. SailPoint, obviously, when the IJ uh, uh, motion started. Uh, back in the, uh, the zeros, we, uh, we added some other companies to the portfolio. Uh, obviously, uh, Ping we worked with, uh, and then Fortro came uh, from uh, yeah, the, uh, the Sun Microsystems team. So, I mean, what we were doing is we were working for a large enterprise companies in, uh, in Europe. So we're not focused on the small medium. 
Uh, and I think what we always like to say is, yeah, we work with complexity. Uh, we also like to say, I think some of my competitors are now uh, using it. Uh, yeah, complexity, deal with it. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's what we, well, what we did because we understood that uh, if it's only one user constituency talking to one application, you don't really need us. But if it's multiple uh, user constituencies, multiple departments, maybe internal and external, you got tons of uh, IAM uh, applications you want to give access to, then certainly you need to have something in, in between. So that was a great, uh, great thing for me to do in, uh, in the zeros. I grew the company pretty fast across Europe. So I mean, I appreciate that the center of gravity on IAM then, but even now, was a bit more on this side of the pond. Uh, but uh, we had a great time actually integrating these technologies and working with, uh, with the parties that came from this side and, uh, and bring that to, to our customer base. The other thing which I realized is that um, uh, complexity is not only in the first implementation, but also in the run stage. So another company which I had on the side of Everett was a, a company called ESSC, uh, Everett Solution Support Center. The idea was that uh, companies needed support while they implement, uh, run and manage the solution. So this is what we did. Uh, by the way, first, second line uh, support also for the big uh, players. And we gave, they gave the solution support for our customers. Because we believed it's not just the technology, it's actually the way it's implemented and how people are using it uh, that needed to be the scope of, of support. Well, I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, to me earlier, uh, but how did you end up in the cloud then? Because this was still all on-prem. Yeah, that's true. 2010-ish, uh, I sat back and I like to do this every once in a while. Just think about, okay, what is the business model that's going to make my company obsolete? Because I'm a firm believer that if you can think of such a model, uh, you better start it yourself. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> 2011, I started iWelcome, which later on became OneWelcome. But the idea that uh, the business model that's going to make a lot of IT companies obsolete is a cloud-based model. So at that moment, our HR, CRM, finance was all going into the cloud. And the thesis was, why not uh, IAM as well? Well, obviously in the US with a couple of companies that started in the same time frame, uh, one of them being Nocta, so they went a bit faster than I did. Uh, there's a big difference, by the way, starting this in Europe or starting that in, in the US. But the idea was it should be possible to deliver all of this via the cloud as well. Which actually meant that my other company, Everett, had to get adjusted because, I mean, if you want to work with a cloud base, you do not uh, implement it all by yourself. You can become slightly less technical, but you elevate the conversation maybe to business level, to architects, to security officers uh, that now want to do things from the cloud. So um, uh, one welcome, uh, I welcome was uh, founded on Valentine's Day. So not only a friendly company name, but also a friendly uh, day to start. <laughs> Um, and I think I do want to highlight the name I welcome later on, one welcome. Um, I mean, we could have called the company iSecurity because a lot of the stuff that we're doing is security. But for me, and thinking back about the personalization thing as well, it is all about giving access in a frictionless way. I mean, frankly, you don't even have to bother, uh, 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 think about security if you don't want to give people access. I mean, the one comes before the other. I also believe that if you make things frictionless and easy to use, it's already safer. I mean, see the whole password discussion. I mean, I never believed in passwords because, I mean, they are creating friction. And if they need to be complex, they're not as safe as we want it to be because we're going to reuse somebody else's or we're going to use the same convention. So I welcome really started with the idea we need to make things easy, frictionless, simple, as good as we can. Yeah, Second, that's interesting. Yeah. I just want to jump in on that point because I think it's interesting how you'll have kind of a push and pull between the business and security where yeah. the business wants to just let people in, six character or four digit pin would be plenty of security. The security team maybe wants like multi-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera. That, that is still happening today in certain places. I think both sides are becoming more conscious of the other side and the rationale behind it. Um, but I also wanted to point out one other thing that you're talking about, like 2010, Talking about the cloud, what's going? It wasn't a slam dunk at that time. It was kind of like, is this cloud thing really going to happen? Is it going to come to fruition? Ultimately, obviously, we all know that the answer is yes. But at that time, it wasn't clear. Oh, absolutely, and uh, even more so in Europe. Eh? So uh, what I used to do is validate any ID. So that starts with a PowerPoint presentation. Talk to a couple of my customers in, in Europe. And then uh, in the UK, the response was, well, Danny, if you organize it well, we may consider. In the Netherlands, it was like a 50-50 answer. And in Germany, it was pretty clear as well. Nine, we're not going to bring our stuff to the cloud. I mean, that was a very clear, uh, clear answer as well. So where we are right, uh, right now is that actually that idea, obviously, 
where that mindset has gone. Um, and today, people are accepted uh, to the fact that there is cloud. Still, uh, not every place. It's getting a bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a little rowdy in out there, and Jim wasn't having it, so he closed Sorry, the door. Sorry, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little too much. I could hear it. It wasn't. It wasn't distracting. So uh, great. So let's get back to the track. Yeah. <clears throat> You want to uh, read uh, the no. spot? We'll, okay. Yeah, good. No, we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it live as we always do. We'll do it live as yep. we do. <laughs> so I mean, uh, that moment in time, the cloud was a difficult thing, especially in Europe. And Europe is not just one place. Uh, each and every country was different, and the uh, the ideas around privacy is different. The ideas about cloud adoption was completely different. Uh, that has changed over uh, the last fifteen years. Obviously, I mean, this is where we are today. Getting back to what you said uh, about the difference of the business versus maybe the security domains. It's true, but there's also a simple answer to it. Step up. <laughs> Do not start with the most complex um, uh, processes or requirements if it can be done with uh, way less. Make it easy for people to join uh, a website where actually privacy is not a concern maybe or where we, uh, you just need to get some uh, lightweight uh, services. And when things get a bit more complex or where you want to add, for instance, additional privacy uh, measures, then you ask people to, uh, to well, actually register to a different kind of authentication factor. Yeah, it seems like the, the use case that I've run into a lot is like you want to buy something for $10 and do you want to go and create an account? That's too much friction yeah. in a lot of cases. So let them do it. Cash checkout. Yeah, we see this a lot, for instance, with insurance companies. Huh? So um, if you uh, have a travel insurance, I mean, do you need to get all your private uh, information on it? Or, I mean, is the risk uh, low enough for an insurance company to say, okay, we accept a certain amount of certainty? That's right. However, if with the same uh, insurance company, uh, you're also going to use their health insurance. And obviously, there's a two sided where we want to have more privacy protection because me as a person want to be protected better and the company needs to protect your identity better. So, uh, and it's logical for you at that moment in time to, for instance, in the Netherlands use an EID or have a multi-factor authentication um, form factor being used. I mean, this is a logical step up uh, in a journey which could have started with maybe username password for the travel insurance itself. So, I mean, step up is usually the way out. And what I've seen a couple of times when you talk to customers, it's, uh, it was also the, uh, Almost like um, uh, people felt completely enlightened. Okay, we can find each other here because we can do both. Yeah, you can actually do both as long as you think it from a customer journey perspective. What's easiest for you to use to start with and what needs to be increased at some stage in time? Yeah, that's, that's such a good point. And so that evolvement, where did that kind of lead you to in terms of this, your journey? Yeah, so maybe yeah, but we're, we're now at the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, the tents. What we did with the cloud-based uh, thing is obviously um, we found some good customers that uh, actually wanted to try it out. What was really interesting to see is that some companies actually uh, went all the way. So uh, you had these early adopters of the cloud. And obviously for us, it was let's focus on these guys and do things. The other thing which, uh, which I asked my techie team to do is uh, adhere to at least one crown principle. And that was be integratable because I don't want to get into a story with our cloud proposition that we yeah, you can only use it if we replace everything. If you've got some stuff over there which is already working well, we integrate with it. Being integratable is a key thing for us to actually uh, get into customer situations and get them acquainted with, okay, this can work from the cloud. Uh, well, they could still sweat the asset they had or actually uh, for us not being just intrusive with everything else. So that's what we did in the, uh, in the early time. 2015-2016, uh, uh, I had to make a bet, I mean, as simple as it is. We saw how uh, the Americans were growing, uh, what happened in terms of financing, and uh, it's, uh, it's true you can sometimes outsmart competition, but there is a threshold of money which you can no longer outsmart. So we had to pick up choices, and that's one of the things I did. I, uh, I choose to uh, completely refocus to the SIAM side, which at that moment in time was a really upcoming, uh, consumer identity and access management or customer identity and access management, Terms being used. Uh, I don't uh, think we, we haven't decided yet. No, we haven't decided mm -hmm. yet. So uh, I used to take it from the consumer uh, angle. Um, and we had this upcoming thing in, the, in Europe called GDPR. So this whole privacy awareness was just going uh, sky high in Europe. And I was looking at it, okay, I mean, this is going to create a lot of friction. This is what the general idea of most people, well, that really doesn't resonate with I welcome. So what we did uh, is we built a science platform, ground up, uh, complete new data model underneath. Uh, and the idea was, let's see how we can make this conversational. So how can we intertwine or inject consent while you're on a customer journey and very conversation? So let me just give you an example because that highlights best. 
And let's assume you're using a taxi app uh, and then uh, you order for a taxi and then the app asks you, okay, can I, use your, uh, can I get your phone number so that the driver can call you once in front of the door? Hey, makes sense for me to give my phone number at this moment in time. Not before, because why are these guys using it for? For this purpose, actually, it makes sense. So what the app does, it asks you the question, you give consent to use it, you give your mobile number. We store, okay, the consent is given for this purpose only. So extremely safe, completely auditable uh, by the DPO, whereas it did not increase any additional friction. Actually, it felt very comfortable for the user. So this is the way we restructured our, uh, our platform. And that also led to uh, end of 2016 uh, that we, uh, we certainly were uh, ranked uh, number two uh, by Gardner after Gigia and Genring, which were the incumbent SIAM providers. Um, I mean, in Europe, there was a bit of a challenge uh, with uh, the, uh, the traditional ones because they felt uh, with GDPR upcoming, this is all like, almost like borderline illegal, getting so much data out of it. I mean, if it was true, or not truthful, but I mean, this is obviously the perception. And with privacy, you have to deal, especially early days, a lot of perception, same as with cloud, by the way. Uh, but really, really had a story that resonated well in uh, the European play. So again, making things frictionless, again, providing step up because that it's a step up consent. Progressive profiling is the term you hear a lot, right? Yeah, it was just, like real hot for a while. You don't hear it as much anymore, but it sounds like that's kind of the vein that you're talking about. Yeah, it's progressive profiling, progressive consent. Uh, that, that's how we looked at it. So, um, uh, and indeed, progressive web profiling was used almost like a marketing play. So, get more and more information. And if somebody actually uh, leaves his Facebook behind, let's see what we can get from it. Uh, yeah. Um, what we did is actually not using it as a marketing uh, thing, but really as like, okay, how can we get consented uh, information from people that you can reuse? Well, I uh, thought it was interesting that you use that scenario of the taxi. And do you want the taxi to be able to call you when they're there? That's a great way to say, yeah, this is why, <laughs> you know, this is this is a great way to not only get the consent, but it's tied to a service that the customer exactly. ultimately wants. Yeah. How important is it to find those those services to tie the consent to? And how difficult is it to track why well, I've only consented to use it in this scenario? So if you know, DoorDash is very big. I use it all the time. Yeah. I want to know when my food is <laughs> is about to arrive or if there's problems, things like that. So I'm giving consent at different points of my customer journey to say, if they don't have the item, call me, right? Or yeah. make a substitution or things like that. Talk to me more about that idea of tying consent, not just for collection sake, but for the journey and the reason why the customer would want to give you that consent. Yes, obviously that's, that's pretty bespoke eh? because um, each and every company has a different uh, user journey and even companies in the same segment will have different user journeys. So, I mean, this is actually where I would say um, uh, SIs and other companies have to come in because they need to somehow transfer the business logic into what we can supply as a well, application vendor because we're not nothing much than that. The only thing we obviously had to do is make sure that the platform is as flexible as possible so you can actually accommodate all these different kind of journeys. Uh, in the end, it's not that different from what you just suggest because you just ask something. That's the whole idea. Ask things and ask it in the appropriate moment because that is going to be the killer. Mm -hmm. It's not a killer it's app. The it's the context it's that the matters, moment. right? Yeah. It's why are you asking me this yeah. and why do I want to give you that consent? Yeah. And from GDPR point of view, then you also need to make sure that you store the reason why. I mean, that, that's key. And then later on, obviously, you can also say, okay, this is the reason why we store it because the, 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 the fundament behind um, GDPR is ask for consent show what you have stored so you can actually change your consent. And the third thing, I mean, yeah, protect the data as good as you can and delete all if somebody wants delete you to it delete it all. You don't need it. I mean, th yeah. that's the kind of uh, the basic behind it, which we could support from uh, the way See, we looked at the world. I do think the security and the privacy are two different concepts. And here's what I mean by that. Like, so we're collecting this information and then we have to secure it. That's Okay, so we're collecting the information and all those checks and consents and the, t the progressive profiling, that's all about the user experience, right? The security is really the GDPR. Now I'm saying this and I'm, I'm okay with being proven wrong or told I'm wrong, but to me, when I looked at all the GDPR, and I haven't looked at it in a while, but all the major fines were data breaches and all the data that got sent out the door. So if I'm collecting Jeff's phone number, and then I'm deleting it because I no longer need it. Now I'm just keeping it because I'm a hoarder of data. That's, a, that's what we're trying to prevent, right? So now I get breached and instead of having 200,000 phone numbers, I have 2,000 phone numbers. 
my fine won't be as bad at least. I don't know. Does that make, am I, am I, I think this the, up? Well, one point is correct. Uh, most of the fine is on data protection and not so much on the, uh, the privacy part. That, that, that's a funny thing. So, I mean, uh, and obviously uh, the one goes hand in hand, but if you have all your data consented and you lose it, I mean, it's still a, a data breach. Right. Uh, so, um, uh, and what is one of the, I would say, flaws almost is that uh, we're not looking at how you collect your data, uh, but really actually uh, looking at, okay, have you made sure it's not being uh, corrupted or it's not being uh, stolen or there's no breach here? This is where most of the fines are. Uh, that that mentality is changing as well. Uh, I think the good news is that people are more aware now of what uh, what's being done with data. I mean, I also still believe that uh, if you get me a nice present, I'll give you everything I have. Uh, and that's obviously this is why this kind of uh, legislation has to come in place because uh, sometimes we need to assist people to be aware uh, what to do. I mean, I don't think we should pamper people because I don't believe that's uh, that's what we need to do, but we should at least create awareness. And this is what you do, for instance, with asking the question at the right moment. We're now going to use this number, going to store it somewhere for this purpose. By the way, yeah, uh, if you want to change it, you can change it somewhere else. Obviously, uh, nobody does it. That's the other side of some uh, privacy sheets. Well, every once in a while, check what's being stored. But you and me, as a normal consumer, we still leave all our data outside. Uh, so I think, I think that still is a bit of the challenge that, uh, that needs to be uh, sorted. Maybe we should be a bit more proactive as, uh, as a company. Okay, we've stored this information from you. Do you still want us to store it? Yes or no? Um, which obviously is a bit difficult sometimes because people uh, yeah, do like to have the data. Uh, How much of a challenge are reason. abandoned accounts? Because you just, you know, you struck a nerve there with me where people sign up for services, myself included, yeah. and then they just stop using the service, but they never actually go back and delete their account or change, you know, information that might be sensitive. Yeah, Jim, I would say it's, it's a business challenge. Huh? I mean, <laughs> so if, if you don't mind as a business, that's not a problem. If you uh, mind about the quality of uh, the people that are using your service uh, and if they are repeatable users, yes or no, then obviously it makes tons of sense to, to clean it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, frankly, we can see everything. Huh? We can uh, do a query on uh, how much use of the account, which account will be dormant for the next X period. Uh, but if, I mean, <laughs> We, we can give you the, um, the information, but if that ends with the action, then uh, so it's, it's a business decision, I would say, to, uh, to clean it up. I think depending on the kind of service, you'll find on with accounts. Uh, so if it's a very lightweight thing, people just, get just uh, if you just need something to get something else, you may just want to put something out and uh, you've got a fake uh, uh, phone number, all that kind of data. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it comes into uh, uh, thoughtfully thinking how you engage and what you want to get out of it, if the data actually is the right data, and if there's a value or non-value uh, in the number of accounts. And there's this balance, right, that you have to, to really kind of straddle is, you know, if you're a company, you want to have as many customers as possible and customer data. But if you were to get breach, you want to minimize the risk of that. And the more customer and customer <coughs> data you have, the potential for the risk along from the breach perspective. Oh, yeah. So how do you balance that? So, okay, well, we want to show we had 100 million customers, but if those 100 million, 50 million are dormant, that can be a problem as well. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's another angle to actually um, make yourself aware that it doesn't make sense to have so many dormant accounts. I mean, right. uh, I don't think that's the key driver for, uh, for businesses today, but uh, I think it's much more, I mean, we like to look at from how you actually uh, grow your business and look at the top line not much. Uh, and then actually dormant accounts obviously do not mean anything. I mean, there's a bit of a cost attached, but that's not a lot, but uh, this is a risk which you may run into, uh, mm -hmm. but in the end, the value of having accounts is that accounts interact with you and do business with you. Otherwise, well, what's the purpose? That's the difference between an engaged customer <laughs> and yeah. just a name and a, a name and a list somewhere that yeah. really isn't doesn't really care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think when I looked at the uh, the fines that can be levied from a GDPR perspective, I mean, the I mean, potential risk based. of it is like it could almost shut down your company. Yeah, and it's, I think that's the one thing that's really interesting for GDPR. This is different for how we typically see things in the U.S. It's like a fixed amount for GDPR though, it's a percentage of your revenue or yeah. something like that, right? And it's a material percentage of your revenue as well. That but if be... you're in a multinational company, right? And it's not limited to the, the revenue that you get in Europe. So if you're maybe an American-based firm doing business around the world and you have a breach and you lose all this data for European citizens, I mean, you could have, you know, massive billions of euros in fines. 
Yeah, so, and obviously that, that that's one side, but I mean, think about uh, what that does with trust in your brand. That's I true. Mean, I, I, I think that's even more devastating. Eh? So I mean, uh, I think proper governance from any company would mean let's protect it very well, because if we lose trust, well, I think that's even farther away from paying, uh, paying off with a fine. So, okay, so we brought it up to like 2016. Yeah. So keep keep going. Yeah, so I mean, uh, so, so that the first was a game changer in focus on this thing. We also saw the market uh, change. Uh, obviously, we uh, infused this this content and in, uh, in the friction experience, all that kind of stuff. Uh, fast forwarding a bit to uh, to early twenties, um, what we saw obviously is that the market space was changing. So I'm mean, now talking entrepreneurial me. Uh, I was looking at okay, I mean, this is a time to either go big or go home. And go big for me really meant I mean, there were so many sub scale uh, companies like ours fighting against the big ones. Uh, so for us, the way to do it is, okay, find a buy and build strategy, bring a lot of these uh, companies together. And I mean, I guess with most of my competitor, the colleagues, uh, and we had a good plan. So the idea was 2021 to more or less, um, yeah, bring a lot of smaller companies together, integrate it, make a platform, play from it, and uh, yeah, have something which is uh, not only European based, but really global based. Until a company came by in the Netherlands called Thales. Thales is not necessarily the most known quantity in the world on IAM, uh, but they've been around for quite some time. And obviously in, uh, in Europe, they were a bit well known because um, it's a huge company, yeah? it's a 20 billion company in, uh, in DFACE, but uh, it's also 20,000 people in digital identity and security. So I mean, nice combination of both. Uh, you may not know, but uh, all the eSIM technology is from Thales. Um, half of the bank cards are from Thales. Uh, if you look at um, driver's license, electronic driver's license, EIDs, border control, uh, biometrics, Thales. And they had a portfolio around identity nexus management. So when I was doing my own play on integrating all these different things, and we looked at uh, user journey orchestration, so we started touching things like wallets, EIDs, uh, validated attributes, um, identity via IDV, uh, secure access. I suddenly found that Thales more or less had all of that somewhere in-house. Um, and it was an interesting kind of realization because it was like a candy shop for identity nexus management technologies. <clears throat> and that made me wonder, I've got my plan here. Uh, it's going to mean the next three, four years, we're going to integrate small companies and, and so on and so forth. Or um, our SIAM, which really is an orchestration authorization engine, uh, takes all these different building blocks which are already within this company and I'll can more or less have an internal buy and build uh, strategy here from a portfolio which has proven itself and which has a global play. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, so Jeff and I were at a smaller firm for, I was there for nine years, Jeff, you were there for probably five years and it wound up being acquired. And I think one of the things that really jumped out to me is the importance of that cultural fit did you find, because you really need to keep, especially your star yeah. players, but really it's continuity for the whole company because the star players all care about the, the players, you know, who maybe aren't the senior executives, but I mean, really like that cultural fit is so key. What did you, did you come to that same realization and how did it work out? Yeah, that's a very good question because obviously everybody asks me why, when are you leaving Thales because you're a serial entrepreneur, you've, uh, you've got your first boss here uh, since you started working. Um, the, the answer to that is A, I like it, uh, and B, um, everybody understood that uh, there are so many proper building blocks that actually really start making sense if we bring it together. So although it's, uh, it's a huge company, uh, the drive from above, but also from a lot of people that actually were responsible for the different products was, okay, if we can bring this forward, if there's somebody that brings in the energy to do it, let's see where this goes. I'm a very firm believer that you need to start with a vision um, and secondly, then bring the team along. I mean, without a vision, you will not be able to bring the team along. In a big company, you also need to be in a position to do so. Eh? So I'm now VPIM, so that means that more or less uh, all these different um, uh, parts report into me. Um, and maybe a bit of the startup mentality is uh, not taking no for, a grant, uh, for, for granted, just go out, uh, talk to people uh, and make them enthusiastic and see where things go. So I have to say within Thales, uh, all the stuff that needed to be done to actually make it a success was in place. Then the question is, will it in the end work out because the devil is in the details. Where we are today, you will see it when you're on the uh, exhibition floor here, 
a lot of different technologies that we have within Thales, inclusive biometrics, inclusive um, uh, identification, all these things connected with RM uh, portfolio, hardware, software, logical, physical, uh, we're going to demonstrate down here in, in the exhibition area. And it is because everybody felt it's now time to collect, connect all the pieces. And Siam was the connecting element. It's the glue between all of that, that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, did I encounter uh, different cultures? Yes, of course we encountered it. I'm also encountering that uh, in different places in the world. But I also have to say that everybody bought into the vision uh, and did the best. And I mean, I think the biggest proof that we're doing the right thing is that we're able to attract talent. I mean, I think this is usually where uh, things fail. I mean, oh, that's a nice story. We're not going to work there. I'm, I'm going to be up. interested to see a lot of what you're talking about. But Jeff always gives me a hard time about being a, a fanboy. Really what I'm a fanboy about is the B2B piece. Yeah. Because to me, this is my first, you know, entry into the identity space was back in 2003. I was responsible for, at, at a company, responsible for pulling together all of our dealer-facing um, applications. What we were lacking was a common identity across all of them. And it was that B2B scenario, so we had a dealership network, and it was the dealerships that went in to manage their own users. So we had six different applications that we started with. Each one had their own user management interface. We had to get it down to one. And it was hard. There was a lot of custom development required. And over the years, I've been waiting for, someone's going to take this problem and fix it with a product. And yet what I continue to see was the innovation on the authentication side has been unbelievable. I mean, there are many different solutions out there that I'm very impressed by, but I still searched for who's going to solve this B2B user management problem. Because here's the, here's the thing, it's like, um, the single sign-on piece, I'm not going to even say it was easy to solve because I wasn't part of solving it, but it was, you know, most companies don't have a huge variance in terms of how they authenticate. But when you talk about delegated administration within B2B, there's a huge variance. And so the, the approach that I saw the most was companies would go out there and build an application to solve this specific problem. That is like one of the very few areas in enterprise IT where people will go out and build their own applications for anymore. And so when I saw that you guys had basically built a product around that, I was like, okay, I really need to dig in because like to me, even you can't even take the basics for granted. Like what I call a dealer or a franchise or a brokerage Another firm that's in the exact same space may call it something different. And then they may have different hierarchical models. And I, let me start with the question, why did you even want to solve that problem? It's such a hard problem to solve. Why don't you just pick something easier to solve and, and just focus on doing the best job at that? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's a question I've asked myself a couple of times in the past <laughs> 25 years as well. Why didn't do something easy? Because I've never been in an easy space. I, I think it's the um, uh, it's almost like the only white space left in in our field. I also believe this is the future white space. So, I mean, then if, if that's the case, then obviously it's logical for us to, for us to jump in. Let, let's break down B2B uh, a bit to, to what it really is, because as you rightly said, it's a lot of different things. So it is business customers, well, that's simple. I mean, uh, it's somebody ordering something uh, in your company on behalf of another company. Still, there's some mandation behind it, because I mean, a company cannot order, a person within the company will order. So secondly, it's usually uh, the ecosystems that you need to manage, which can be somewhere when you're in an R&D department, but uh, later on when there's a supply chain, there will be vendors, there will be tons of different people. If it's capital goods, most likely afterwards, there's also a service ecosystem to manage. So, I mean, when the ecosystems get big, and then obviously the challenge is very big as well. And then a third, more or less main case is yeah, what we indeed say, it's the, uh, the dealers, the brokers, agents, huh? the business to business to consumer may, uh, most of the time, or sometimes business to business to business to consumer, or no uh, consumer in the end. So, I mean, these all these kind of things you somehow need to, uh, to be able to cover with well, product capabilities. That's obviously a challenge. We've uh, we focused on that from uh, 2020 onwards, more or less. Uh, so very strong capabilities in 
delegation because this is obviously where it needs uh, needs to start. It's a different thing also from the IGA side because you're not talking about a scope you know, you're partly talking about a scope of people you do not have access to. And they will be invited to, for instance, uh, use systems that you uh, give to uh, of, uh, make available to, uh, to others. Second critical capability is what we call fine-grade authorization. Uh, and the other thing which we typically see in a lot of these kind of uh, scenarios is distributed identity. So you're using the identity which is outside of what you control. So then orchestration comes into place as well. These are the modules we have to actually cope with the complexity. And obviously it depends on which kind of customer scenario, eh? a B2B2C uh, insurance company is different than what we, for instance, do for the European Central Bank. Just to give you that example, uh, I mean, uh, any bank has to log in in the, uh, in the ECB, but it's not a bank logging, it's somebody. So there will be a super user, that super user can assign other users that may actually be super users to assign other users. That's right. So you see how far away from your direct uh, visibility of control it is. And still you need to start checking, okay, are the users uh, there been invited to get access to the system? Have they actually accepted inv invitation, yes or no? Hey, we see people are no longer using it, so what does it mean? I mean, is the person gone? Because you don't know if you're at the ECB site. Another very critical one which we see is uh, on supply chain. So let me just give you an example of a, uh, uh, an airplane manufacturer. More than 70% of a plane is manufactured by somebody else than the company itself. Think about it. We're not talking about 5,000 people from outside. Like assembling it, right? 100,000, yeah, because the cockpit is being built by somebody else. Well, towels sometimes in this case. Um, uh, but anything in the airplane is being built by, a lot of things are built by other people. And the other complexity here is that they do not have to have access to the airplane and the final assembly line all the time. They need to have it for these two days. And this guy is working in uh, the cockpit, so he's got a clearance on top level security. The other person installing the, uh, the toilet in the back of the plane has a different security clearance. And they all work in the same hall and walk in the same hall. So, and this is another thing which uh, I like from uh, being with Thales. This is, I'm not going to promote too much, but this is something which actually makes the story complete. Is it doesn't stop just with uh, the physical, the logical part. This actually goes into the uh, to the physical. So actually, we add to the delegation model things like wearables that you can use, so you can walk hands free through this thing, and you've got clearance because you are the guy that has to go into the cockpit, and it's all being feathered. And I mean, we've done the uh, verification part with that wearable to authenticate uh, to authenticate yourself and go in. That same wearable will be used by Jim three days later. So obviously it's been connected to another uh, delegation model. So we actually combine all these kind of things in a full proposition. And I mean, uh, I now make it sound very simple, but if you think about the different use cases, the different uh, types of people, the different kind of rules and roles that uh, you have to somehow fit in, the authorizations, which are critical here, obviously, and the, the people that actually manage the authorizations, I mean, it's a very, very, very complex problem. Yeah. Yet, not easy to be solved by build it yourself either. And the crazy part is though, it's like, one product can fill that scenario, but it also could be um, a fast food franchise model yeah. or insurance brokerage model. It's really all falls within this B2B space. It's a company interacting with it, with customers, which are not, it, the actions are taken by individual human beings, but it's on behalf of a company. The relationships also, you know, the relationship of that fast food company is really with the franchisee. It's the contract. Yeah. Now you know, all the people who are acting on behalf of the franchisee are operating within that contract. They're agents of that company. It's yeah. And as one constituency, which we didn't discuss in this context, we also use the same technologies for gig workers. And that's interesting because I mean, what's going to happen with the traditional employee, which is starting with HR? Whereas most of the companies now actually have people that do not start with HR, but they work for them for a gig. For uh, So think about seasonal labor, think about all gig workers that work for multiple companies that quite often bring their own identity. So again, you need to orchestrate step out to what they yeah. uh, do, bring wallet technology and all that kind of stuff. And let me give you a very nice example again. It's a bring your own van for a post company. So uh, these people um, uh, around Christmas, New Year need more people to drive around and deliver parcels. So there's a website where you register then you add some uh, of your um, identity uh, details, which will be a step out to a, an, an ID provider. Then obviously you need to prove that you've got a driver's license. Again, step out to a driver's license uh, registry. Then you need to prove you actually have the van. So there's a step out to a car registry. Uh, then there's some other stuff you need to do. So 
I mean, if you want to orchestrate these kind of things, and by the way, this person then, after all this fetting, will be working on this one distribution center on this corner of the country, where actually the person that actually needed that one has a delegated responsibility to actually start this process. So again, it all uh, comes together. Same if you look at, for instance, you talked about restaurants. We've got a very nice example in the UK. I mean, they've got 30, uh, 3,000 pubs and restaurants, but there's a huge amount of seasonal labor. I mean, this is not high security eh, compared to the airline line manufacturer. This is high turnover. And again, it's something you need to manage. Yeah, so interesting that it's like the internal or enterprise identity management has become more commoditized over time. And the reason why I think that that, hap that was enabled was people started just transitioning to these best practices. The authoritative source for employees is here. Maybe it's also for non-employees, but maybe you have a different data set for non-employees and then you get them into a centralized system and provision out their access and use tickets or connectors. But that starts to break down when you get into the CIAM model. Um, so here's, let me turn that into a question. So you have the CIM model, but you still have to, so here's what's happened over time is that companies have taken what their business process is with their customers. They've been hesitant to change that, right? Because it's a model that works. And when you only get one chance to mess up with your customers, right? So they take these processes from technology to technology and have to customize and customize, which I think is ultimately a death sentence. And what I want to know is like, is that something you talk about with executives as you talk to them about, hey, this is the approach that you should take when moving your CIM program forward? Or what are some of the other things maybe in addition to that, that you know, become your main talking points? Yeah, this obviously is one because, uh, well, uh, you mentioned commodity. I would say B2E use cases are commodity. Everybody knows this for the last 30 years. So, I mean, is it really different from 30 years ago? No, technology's concept is different, but uh, what you want to do, uh, give your employees access to information uh, is, different, uh, is more or less the same. Siam on a very uh, simple case, I mean, a website uh, and having uh, consumers uh, is pretty commoditized as well because we all can do it. It really gets more complex when you talk about this B2B kind of engagement or where there's a lot of other components that, that fit in or where there's an omni-channel kind of approach. So uh, what we've seen, especially in the B2B side, more than even in, in any of the others, is the do-it-yourself. And it is because we would just want to mimic our specific um, uh, procedures and uh, processes into the IT that we deliver, oh, which works if you've got a huge IT department and you know these guys are here to stay. Uh, it doesn't work when your AIT budget is shrinking because people want to start using different kinds of services. Uh, I mean, that has to come with accepting some kind of standard. And then the question is, okay, uh, where is the trade-off between the configuration that you can do with systems like ours, which actually can go pretty far, uh, maybe amend some of the ways you engage things and accept the fact that that is still better than being completely dependent on uh, you know, bespoke, custom, uh, and all these things. So. The further you go up to the chain in the company, the more they realize that there's also future proof as being a key element for uh, what needs to be done. I mean, if the gap is too big, obviously, then the gap is too big. But uh, I would say uh, in quite a lot of situations, you can actually uh, work with uh, the current identity fabrics that are around. So we're here at Identiverse. What do you get out of a conference like this? Well, I mean, for sure, from me, uh, I, um, there's different questions for uh, my team. I mean, obviously, we like to engage with customers. We like to engage with uh, some of the partners that we have. Uh, got a lot of partners here in the US. That's good. It's also good to see where the industry is going. Uh, uh, having said that, I mean uh, that also happens in the in, uh, interactions between the companies itself. Uh, we uh, we obviously hope to get uh, commercial success from this, but um, I really like to see what the others are doing uh, and engage a bit with. Uh, I would like like to say competitors or some companies which are, which are very close to us because. I think I mentioned the word integratable quite a lot of time. Uh, there's a lot of technology uh, here exposed um, uh, to us as well, which again, may be a good integration for us going forward. What's an area of identity that you're really bullish on right now? 
Well, I mean, the bullish part is the B2B side. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously there's one thing which uh, everybody talks about is AI. Um, and, and why? Well, what I like from AI is not necessarily, again, the security uh, things that we're trying to do with that, because we've been trying to deal with that. I really like, again, keyword conversational part of it. So use uh, the chat, but use the question, the conversation method to actually get into the data. And I would say use it for all uh, user groups. So, I mean, if I'm a um, um, uh, user of the system, I, I would like to ask, okay, what actually do you have on me? Mm -hmm. And get information back That's rather right. than start to search somewhere. I mean, this is the kind of interaction, which obviously I love, as if you've been talking about conversations all the time. Something similar you can do on uh, uh, A-B testing. Okay, we, um, we've got this model and we've got that other uh, user journey. Which one works better? And where do we see differences? Is that in the country? I mean, and that kind of information getting back in natural language, obviously, or maybe say we're getting this back in financial terms or in business terms. I mean, that makes tons of sense. So I think AI can be great help for us in these kind of things as well. So I like to take AI to the conversation part and frictionless part on top of what we can do uh, with that to detect anomalies and uh, get a better yeah, securance, uh, security uh, profile out of it. Yeah, that's the way I see it as well. I mean, I think one of the big benefits is when AI gets, you know, the same kind of AI that you use with open, uh, open AI or chat GPT and the Google AI or Gemini is being able to go in there and have an iterative conversation yep. through natural language. That's going to enable non-technical people to ask business exactly. questions and get real answers that they can understand and then iterate on. Yep. I do think we've got a bit of a challenge uh, on, uh, I think it's going to be a, a art almost like prompt engineering. Uh, where do mm -hmm. you start? And uh, do we get the right answer to uh, the question we're asking? And obviously AI sometimes can just go in the other direction. I've did some, uh, some of the tryout over the weekend myself as well. Uh, it's interesting to see, but I mean, we're going to get there because this gets smarter and smarter. So I think this whole co-pilot, the, the conversation, conversational part is going somewhere. It's also fair to say, I think at this moment we're in, uh, not even in prototype, but in proto-hype uh, situation. So everybody, uh, it's a second buzzword. Well, we've seen some buzzwords in our industry, uh, blockchain, zero trust. I mean, uh, I had some zero trust coffee today. I mean, <laughs> the 100% extra AI. Uh, yeah, extra, uh, exactly. But, but I think AI is a different uh, dimension to it because it's going to change fundamentally how we, uh, how we work with our systems. And I think that's, uh, that's a great uh, addition. Obviously, it's also going to impose some threats because, uh, I mean, we're on the trust side. So... What will it do with trust? Uh, I'm not sure if we're talking to, uh, to Jim or is it deep fake? Well, he's in the same room, so we know it is. But I mean, so what does that do, for instance, with uh, biometrics? I mean, how is that going to change uh, over time? Mm -hmm. Is it? I mean, uh, so it, uh, it imposes all kinds of new, uh, new things to us, both in security as well as opportunity side. Anybody who listens to the show knows I'm very bullish on AI. <laughs> yeah. So there will be obviously challenges going with it, but I think I, I think you're totally right. The, the word I that I want to pick from what you just said is fundamental. Yeah. I think it's a fundamental change in the way that we yeah. approach not only building solutions, but answering questions that people are going to have. How great would it be to have a conversation with your identity platform? Yeah. I mean, it sounds very nerdy <laughs> to say that, but to be able to get the information out of it in a way to say, hey, you know, what can X organization do with my data? What have I, what pieces of my privacy have I, you know, whatever questions I want to ask it, right? How can it be used? And to get back an actual answer that the user can understand exactly. is game changing. Yeah. And you're not talking to the IM system, eh? you're talking from a user perspective to your portal, to your service, to your app, to your uh, taxi driver. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so that's obviously how, it's, how it works. And that's what I like from uh, what you see AI can now do. I think that that's one of the big game changers for, uh, I mean, is also what we uh, invest in right now because we need to see how we can quickly integrate that into uh, into the conversations uh, that we have with the customers mm -hmm. from a techie enablement perspective. So is it my turn to do the... Um, yeah, you the, want to do like an overrated, underrated? Like, what do you want to yeah, do? Yeah, so we always go out with uh, a lighter note question. And so my uh, what I've been pushing for for a while is overrated or underrated. Those are your two options. And the topic is Las Vegas. Overrated or underrated? Well, yeah, I think for me it's overrated. Why do you say that? Oh, we talked about artificial <laughs> in terms of intelligence. So, I mean, it's obviously it's insane if you if you fly in, you're flying over the desert, and you see what's happening here, and I uh, and I see how much uh, 
energy we consume, how much um, and what do we consume here. I mean, uh, so obviously it's fantastic that we have this this crazy place where we can come together as people. But um, uh, yeah, in the end, uh, after two days of walking around, uh, it's done for me because then the new stuff is is out of it, and then you start looking at maybe a little bit of the insanity of it. So. Uh, but if I leave home and talk to people and say, I'm going to Las Vegas, everybody said, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so what's really true? Huh? Yeah, I, I guess I fall on the other side. I think it's underrated only because I think it's such a well-built town for conferences. I could care less about gambling yeah. or anything like that, right? Drinking. I'm, I'm not a fan of like either. I don't do anything. But for, to be able to come to a town that is... You never have to look for a hotel room. There's plenty of them. There's plenty of spaces, great spaces. There's plenty of places to have conversations after the fact. Restaurants, little nooks, speakeasies like Jim and I went to last night, right? Things like yeah. that where you can have a good time, but you're not, I guess, you don't, you don't have to be in a situation where you're kind of the hustle and bustle. It's a very interesting town. It's very efficient, too. A lot of the water usage here is definitely recycled and things like that. But it is definitely like an act of defiance to have a city like this in the middle of a desert. It doesn't make sense. And yet, it, for me, it works. It's easy to get to. There's plenty of things to do, see, and you know, work through conversations or whatever. But only because I don't care about gambling or you know, drinking or anything like that. I'm definitely in the underrated camp. And so first I have to... Have to justify that with, I think a lot of people hate Las Vegas. I thought you did. No, I've never been on the I hate Las Vegas side. I've had some times where it's like, you're there for a week, and by the end of the week, you're just like, get me out of here. But usually that's because my biggest knock on Las Vegas is how expensive it is. If you realize you've been here for seven days and you've spent $2,500 or $3,000, it's like, I, unless you're like uber rich, like that's, you're going to be like, wow, that's, I spent a lot of money. To be there you know there's all the ten dollar bottles of water and things like that but here's the thing about las vegas so i've been to a lot of cities around the world but i've been to most of the big cities in the united states there's nothing else like las vegas right so it is completely unique um the other thing is you get these epic things in las vegas and one was one that i visited yesterday called the sphere so we all know the sphere now, right? You, drive, you fly in, you see this big ball, and you're like, what is that thing? And it's so cool looking. Wait till you go inside. You go inside and watch like this movie that they have now, and you will be completely blown away. And again, it's like only something they would do in Las Vegas because you have so many tourists coming in. Then finally, I'll say what Jeff said, which is um, it's a perfect town for conferences. When they try and put a conference in like Dallas or even Orlando, to me, it's like super underwhelming. There's so many drawbacks and it's not laid out for conferences. You almost have to rent a car or you come here, you do not need to rent a car. In fact, I think you're crazy if you do rent a car. <laughs> I was just, gonna say the same thing. Yeah, you just Uber around and, or walk and get your exercise in like, I don't know. So I'm a clearly, you know, Las Vegas is underrated. We're going to change your mind, Danny. <laughs> oh, well, let's do that then. Let's go yeah. out. We'll do that tonight. All right. Why don't we go ahead and wrap it up for, for this episode? Danny, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. You've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, and we're going to see you probably tonight at the event that uh, Talis and RSM are, are working on together. So uh, with that, we'll leave it for this week. We'll have links in our show notes for people to check out Talis when welcome. Uh, to link with you on uh, LinkedIn as well as uh, Jim and I. Uh, we're on the web, idacpodcast.com. We're on YouTube, Jim. I'm getting the I'm getting the plug in. YouTube.com slash at IDAC podcast. That's or you could just go to YouTube and search for identity at right. the center, but you won't have to we're type that there. much. Yeah. On, on the web, we're pretty close on the identity search rankings. Now we're working on YouTube. Uh, Twitter. Uh, what are we on Twitter? IDAC podcast. At. And I, of course, at IDAC podcast. And then Mastodon, IDAC podcast at infosec.exchange. How many connections do we have on Mastodon? Three? No, we have a few. <laughs> There's a few people. I think it's a, it was the refuge from Twitter about a year ago, I would say, when Elon took over and started to cause havoc over at X or yeah. Twitter or whatever. 
It's kind of died down though by now, right? No, it's still it's still going. I mean, it's still the, the I, Fediverse, as they call it. I never used it. <laughs> I know you don't. <laughs> I do all the things. I, I really don't spoiler, care. I'm the one who's actually running the uh, the Mastodon account. Um, all right, let's leave it there. Thanks everybody for listening and or watching. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to everybody in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.